Welcome to 10.5, the official podcast of the OPP Association. I'm one of your co-hosts. My name is Scott Mills. And I'm Emily Brown, and we are the Strategic Communications Coordinators and your hosts. For those of you listening for the first time, the OPP Association represents nearly 10,000 members of the Ontario Provincial Police in Canada. Our members are at the heart of everything that we do, and they are our greatest strength. And we're dedicated to keeping our members in the public informed about key issues that impact policing across Ontario. Well, thanks, uh, Emily. Uh, Today, we welcome uh, retired, but not retired, and uh, she'll explain this, OPP uh, Provincial Constable Deborah Brown, and uh, she's coming to us from the Georgian Bay Detachment today, and... uh, we have naturopathic Dr. Jody Snyder. I believe Jody's coming to us from Aurelia today. And we are going to be discussing menopause for police officers. And uh, I just want to note that this is the 50th uh, year. 2024 is the 50th year for the Ontario Provincial Police for women in policing. But this particular issue we're going to discuss, it's, it's not just for women. If you're a man out there and you're like, why am I listening to this? You need to listen to this. So uh, welcome, uh, Deborah, and welcome, Jody. Thanks for entertaining my idea for this podcast, Emily and Scott. I'm really looking forward to talking to you about it. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Really glad we're having this conversation. Deborah, Jody, really appreciate you being here. So Deborah reached out to us with this idea for the podcast to discuss the effects of menopause on police officers. And uh, as we mentioned, we're looking forward to it because it's something that we don't feel is really talked about or, or talked about as much as we think that it should. So thank you for bringing this topic to our attention and for all the legwork behind the scenes to make this happen. You're very welcome. I hope that we can discuss uh what we discussed can help many police officers out there, female and males. Well, awesome. We're going to get going. We've got a whole bunch of questions to throw at both of you. And uh, just for everybody listening, uh, how this all kind of came about was once Deborah approached us with the idea, we, we asked Deborah for some key messages. What do you want to cover? And then we found, uh, Deborah found Dr. Jody Snyder. And uh, we asked the same from Dr. Snyder. So um, we've kind of put everything together in a really good package. And I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. So first off, Dr. Snyder, uh, I understand that uh, you have a practice in Aurelia. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your naturopathic doctor qualifications. Sure. So as you said, I'm a naturopathic doctor. I graduated from the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine. I have a general practice in Aurelia, Ontario, out of uh, a clinic called Synergy Healthcare. And I've been in practice for about 13 years now. Um, I'm a mom of two, and I'm also 45 years old myself. So this topic is really near and dear to my heart because I'm actually dealing with a lot of these perimenopausal symptoms that we're going to chat about today. In the last few years, I've done a lot of education on menopause and perimenopause uh, within this community. And uh, I'm just really happy to be part of what I see as a bit of a shift Uh, toward trying to better understand what women are going through and in turn then better support women through this time of their life. Let's jump right into it. Um, Can you tell us the difference between menopause versus perimenopause and how long it lasts and when does it start? Sure. Yeah, that's a great place to start. So I'm going to kind of give two explanations of menopause. I think Very simply put, and probably the answer that most people know is simply that menopause is the last day of uh, a woman's period. So it's the the day of the woman's last period. The tricky thing is we don't know it's your last period until we've gone a full year without a period. So it's kind of in hindsight that we realize we've already gone through menopause and that we're on the other side of it. That makes us postmenopausal. Obviously, the, the years then leading up to menopause are what we consider perimenopause. And perimenopause is where all the fun happens. Uh, this is really where all of the hormones start changing. 
Um, and this is typically when women are most symptomatic. Uh, perimenopause can last anywhere from seven to 10 years generally. Um, the average age of menopause is 51 years old, but we can hit menopause. It's still considered quite normal to hit menopause anywhere between the ages of 45 and 55, roughly. If I can give a slightly more in the weeds or accurate description of menopause, it's when we no longer have any eggs left. So women are born with all the eggs that we're ever going to have throughout our lifetime. And that supply and the quality of our eggs start to dwindle until eventually we run out. And once we run out of eggs, there's really no reason to ovulate. If we don't have any eggs and we aren't ovulating, there's really no reason to build and shed this juicy lining uh, that we do to support a pregnancy. So in turn, our period stops. So as much as we usually equate menopause with the period ending, it's actually really that we've run out of eggs at that point, to be more accurate. That's a, uh, that's a great uh, explanation, Jody. I, I got just one question coming off the top of my head. So sure. <laughs> can, if a woman's in peri, perimenopause, can, it, can she still get pregnant? Absolutely. Yes. Something to be for women to be very aware of. So there's a ton of hormone fluctuations during that time, but the fact is the hormones can still support a pregnancy. So there might be lots of changes happening, but pregnancy is still very possible. Yes. Uh, interesting. So I, I want to stick with you uh, for the moment here, Jody. Um, what symptoms are associated with these hormone changes uh, in perimenopause? And are there stages? Can we test for menopause? Like when do you, when do you 100% know that you're there? Um, if you could answer those, that'd be great. Sure. We do base diagnosis, if we're calling it that, really mainly on symptoms. Um, but the symptoms are really varied and there are so many. I actually, specifically for this question, I wrote a few down because I knew I was going to miss and women are going to, you know, be sort of thinking in their head, why haven't you mentioned this? But um, so we generally associate menopause with hot flashes and night sweats. And that is a big symptom. A lot of women do suffer greatly with those. Um, but our periods change and often and unexpectedly, they're actually going to get heavier, and they might even come more often initially. Um, the mood changes can be quite intense. There's often depression. There's usually heightened anxiety. There's increased irritability. Fatigue is a big one. Weight gain is a big one. Uh, loss of libido, vaginal dryness, chronic urinary tract infections, uh, joint pain can be quite extreme. Dry eye, heart palpitations are something that maybe is a little less commonly known, but is quite significant. Um, new or increasing migraines or headaches, bloating, brain fog, body odor changes, itchy skin, like the list just goes on and on. It's quite, um, it's quite varied. Not every woman is going to get all of these symptoms. I know that Deborah had quite a time and she did experience a lot of them, and I'm sure she'll be talking about that. But um, for the most part... Yeah, not all women are going to experience all of these, but, um, you know, you're pretty lucky to get away with not experiencing any of them, put it that way. How do we diagnose it? So there aren't really great tests for diagnosing it, unfortunately. When we're in early menopause, progesterone starts to decline, and it tends to decline slow and steady over the course of the perimenopausal years. Estrogen declines as well, but for estrogen, it's a really chaotic decline. It's chaos. It doesn't decline in a linear pattern at all. So there will be days where estrogen is very high initially and days where estrogen is low. And the body doesn't, and the body and the brain do not like chaos. And this is where we're going to see the symptoms such as fatigue. This is kind of an early menopause if we're really staging it or early perimenopause, I should say more correctly. So you're going to see fatigue. You're probably going to see increased anxiety, a lower tolerance for stress. You might no notice that periods are changing. As I said, more often than not, you're actually going to get heavier cycles initially and your cycles might come more often. PMS symptoms typically worsen. Um, we might find that weight loss starts to get harder in those initial stages. Um, as I say, because the hormones are fluctuating so much, we really, I, you know, if a patient comes into my clinic and they're telling me that they're experiencing this, 
I'm going to tell them they're probably in the early stages of perimenopause, but there is not a great test for that. As we get into the later stages of perimenopause and there's just more reliable decline in estrogen, then we're also going to see a more reliable rise in something called follicle stimulating hormone or FSH. And so at some point testing your FSH, if you're really curious about kind of where you are in this journey, uh, testing FSH via the blood can, can be useful. You know, if we're seeing fairly high numbers there, we know kind of where you are in this sort of stage. But early on, it, it's not going to tell us much because it's fluctuating so much. That's, that's a great information, Jody. Uh, thanks for putting that all together for us. Uh, Deborah, we're going to switch right over to you because the title of this podcast is Police Officers and Menopause. You've been a police officer your entire career. Um, I'm, I want to throw it over to you. Can you give us some background on your career in the OPP and explain exactly why you reached out wanting to discuss menopause? I came to the OPP later in my career. I started off as a municipal officer for over 25 years. I had the great fortune to work First Nations with the Anishinaabeg Police Service on Christian Island for two. And then I came to OPP in the last two and a half years before I retired. And I quit retirement, and that's why I'm back part-time. The reason I want to reach out is I was listening to some of your podcasts, and I thought they are great, but they only were for a few people. But this is a podcast that I thought would be great for at least 100% of the women in the OPP because every one of them will go through menopause, whether it's naturally, medically induced, uh, surgically, whatever. Um, and I also thought it would be great for some of the guys to uh, listen in on it. As I indicated, my email, um, navigating menopause with shift work and frontline duties was not easy. As you might know, perimenopause comes many years earlier as Jody indicated, and that it's actually only one day uh, becomes menopause and you're postmenopausal. Uh, I could have probably won an Olympic gold medal for the symptoms I have. And I know I indicated earlier that I had listened to a podcast by Dr. Mary Claire Haver, and she described so many different symptoms, and I swear I had every one of them. I even had my husband listen to the podcast, and he came to me and says, you have every single one of those. I said, yes. Um, for me, it started around 47 or so, um, and instead of slowing down my periods, I would get them almost every day for two and a half years with a two or three day span where I wouldn't have one, and then it would come right back. Um, I had sleep issues, but, but I've had those my entire career, and my doctor would at times, you know, at the time, my doctor would not send me to a sleep apnea clinic because he always had an excuse of my fatigue as being a shift worker a new mom, a mom with a toddler and twin infants, a mom of young children, teens. It's just stress. Uh, when I was retired, I was finally able to get my new doctor to send me. And it was turned out to be a blessing because I actually stopped breathing 59 seconds or more, 16 to 17, 20 times an hour. So I'm on a sleep apnea machine, which helps. They also sent me to a sleep psychiatrist to help me get through and navigate back through getting sleeping, uh, a half decent night's sleep. Um, hot flushes don't help, mind you. So you wake up and you throw off the covers and then you freeze to death and you put them back on and you fall asleep again, only to be woken up. Um, due to an incident many years ago, my son, I ended up with what's called cortisol hot flushes. And those sort of start when you're extremely stressed, but those are very different than perimenopausal. Those ones came up my back and over my head. The very menopausal ones, they come from the core and work outwards and they can come at any time. So I would find it quite often I'd be dressing for work and, you know, you've got in the wintertime, you have to throw on that dickie. And it was like I couldn't get it off fast enough because I was soaking wet before I even got out of the change room from all the uniform and clothing that you have to wear. And I mean, you have to wear it, but it, it uh, was really difficult. Um, also, things like the hat. You know, we're supposed to wear a baseball hat all the time, but I had I developed migraine headaches, and the hat was just horrible when I had my usual, just normal, everyday headache for the last four months. Um, on one night, I had two expe unexpected, uh, as I call them, uniform malfunctions. I had an accident uh, 
and where I end up having to change my uniform twice from an unexpected visit from Mother Nature. And eventually that night I end up having to go home early because of a migraine that started and I was down and out for a weekend and couldn't come to work night, my night shifts, which drove me crazy because it was uh, a Saturday night shift that I didn't want to miss. Also, I had a lot of stroke-like symptoms um, and that led me to go to cardiologists, neurologists, rheumatoidologists. And in the end, the cardiologist said, there's nothing you do. The neurologist said I had complicated migraines. The rheumatoidologist, well, thank goodness I'm still working with her, but she declared it fibromyalgia. I went to my own doctor who said, my joint pain is because I've used up all my body from all my workouts, from sitting in the cruiser for so long. I'm not an athlete. I'm an athletic person, but I'm not an Olympic athlete. I I did not use up my body. I have just have low estrogen. Um, I've been placed on a plethora of medicines that did not help. So it, it's it's been a tough go. You know, this is going to help a lot of women who can relate to you, Deborah. So thank you for being so open about that. And, um, you know, considering everything that you've been through, when when you look back, can you talk a little bit about how women maybe can prepare physically, mentally, socially for, for this transition? Um, yeah, one of the best things is, is this generation, which I'm in, Generation X, we are the first generation to actually start talking about this openly. Um, my mom just would ignore me. I have an older sister, 11 years older. She went through menopause at 46 and had not one symptom. So now I'm finding that we're discussing it with our friends. Um, you can pick up a woman's magazine and it's there. My husband watched The National and came to me and says, do you know this is 14 years long? Do you know there's 37 symptoms and you have all of them? I said, yes, dear. He's becoming aware because we're talking about it. So physically, you need to just make sure you you. you Keep up with your workouts, um, maybe not so much cardio, more into the weights, because that helps with weight loss. Uh, mentally, know that these things are coming. I did not know that my lack of confidence is probably part of this menopause. All of a sudden, I, was, I didn't want to go out on my bicycle. I, I'm nervous about going out on my motorcycle. No reason, just all of a sudden had a lack of confidence. Know that your body's changing, and it, yeah, you don't have to accept it, because I know I didn't. But understand that um, a lot of things come with that and that lack of confidence with your body changing. You just have to find ways of dealing with it socially. Um, you feel like you don't, you go to the party and all of a sudden you can't go in. You have a bit of anxiety or you have whatever it might feel to you. So you just have to know these things are coming. So the more you can read the podcasts that are out there, uh, talking with your friends, that sort of stuff really helps prepare for it. I appreciate that. And Jody, we'll kick it over to you. Basically the same question, wondering if you want to expand on that about, you know, women, you know, coming into this transitional time and, and how they can better equip themselves. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I would love to see women throughout their lifespan, honestly, but especially in their thirties, I mean, there's so much going on that typically is like the fertile years they're having kids thinking ahead to the menopausal years, I realize is a big ask. But if women in their 30s can start learning about what they're about to go through, really educating themselves, as Deborah said, listening to the podcast, talking to friends about it, going to see a naturopathic doctor, um, going to chat with their medical doctor about it. Um, if, if we can start educating ourselves before the symptoms become significant before it starts affecting quality of life. I think that would make a big difference. And then what we do about it at that point is we just try to be the healthiest version of ourselves we can be. So menopause or the hormone changes that are happening, they they can be quite inflammatory. We want to keep inflammation in our body down. If we are eating well. So gold standard, probably Mediterranean diet. If we're eating well, if we're drinking lots of water, if we're really focusing on getting good quality sleep, and if we aren't sleeping well, we're working to change that. If we're getting exercise, as Deborah said, including like weight bearing activity, which again is something I think we're hearing more about in women, but generally speaking, you know, women are aiming to be skinny to be lean and i think i hope that mindset's changing we need to be strong um so if we're eating healthy we're sleeping well we're drinking water we're exercising 
you know, we will suffer less if, if we're addressing our stress, we will suffer less through the perimenopausal period. If we're just, if our vessel, if our body is feeling healthier as we head into those years. Jody, can you navigate uh, this whole perimenopause, menopause stage using natural foods methods? Um, yeah, as I said, like the Mediterranean diet is probably the most thoroughly researched and probably the gold standard for what a true anti-inflammatory diet looks like. Um, so going into detail there just a little bit, that's lots of fruits and vegetables, that's lean proteins, that's whole grains. Um, it's, it's not a really restrictive diet, but it is a very healthy diet. So I encourage people to sort of look into what that looks like. And then from, you know, there are, there are natural supplements, there are natural things I suppose we could do to, to support that process as well. Um, you know, maybe more symptom specific. So things like probiotics, um, omega-3 fatty acids, curcumin is a big one as an anti-inflammatory and to support our brain health. And obviously none of these are sort of blanket recommendations. You really want to talk to your doctor or your naturopath path about these things and which ones are right for you. But naturally there's a ton of things we can do. And then, you know, I think we're going to get into the hormone therapy talk, but hormone therapy really is also our, I think probably our best option at this point for mitigating symptoms as well. I'm really glad you brought that up, Jody. Uh, that was actually my next question because uh, hormone replacement therapy or HRT is a big topic and you you hear a lot about it and, and it can be confusing. I'm a 49-year-old woman and uh, I get a little bit mixed up about it. So can you go into it a little bit more? Sure. Yeah. There was a study and I have, I, I want to say it was in the 80s. There was a study done on hormone therapy and I think the results of that study were misinterpreted misinterpreted greatly. And unfortunately, it led to a generation of women and doctors alike believing that hormone therapy was detrimental to our health, that specifically it increased our risk of cardiovascular disease or stroke and breast cancer. And what we now know is that those results were misinterpreted and the study was flawed in many ways. And we now know that a good majority of women, really, truly a good majority of women um, will find a lot of benefit with hormone therapy and that it is very safe and in many ways, very protective because it is maintaining, you know, not the same level, but a, a, a level of estrogen that can be very protective in terms of our risk of cardiovascular disease, of, of cognitive decline, dementia, of, um, of uh, so many different issues and certainly help to mitigate the symptoms, which can be um, life changing and affect quality of life in so many ways. So we're really, we're really turning a page on hormone therapy. Um, I do think there's more education, especially in smaller communities that need that needs to come. Um, but, but it is a, it is a real viable, very safe option for many, many women. Hey, Jody, I just want to jump in there. Um, is this like a, a shot or a needle or a pill or what, what does hormone replacement therapy look like? There are lots of options. You could do all of those things. Um, I think generally speaking now, knowing what we know, we want to stick with certain types to, to be the safest, I guess, to have the fewest risks associated with them. So generally speaking, we want to do an estradiol and we want to do a progesterone. And most commonly in Canada, well, I shouldn't say most commonly, probably the safest route in terms of getting the estradiol specifically would be through um, like a transdermal route. So a patch would be a good example. Estradot is kind of the brand name of one of uh, the estrogen patches that we're using in North America now. Um, that bypasses the liver. There doesn't have to be as much detoxification. It tends to be better for our risk stro or stroke risk. Um and then we want to use a progestogen, um, a progesterone, 
Um, and that often is in capsule form. But yes, you can do vaginal estrogen, you can do shots, you can do oral, you can do transdermal, there, there is lots of options. And this is another area where I feel like women need to get very educated, because unfortunately, maybe some of our medical doctors are not quite as educated yet. And I think that's changing. Um, in terms of what the options are, the safest options, how many options there are, and really giving women like the full spectrum of what their choices are. But yeah, there's there's so many options for hormone therapy. Jody, I just want to jump off script for one one second here. Uh, if we still have any guys listening to this, <laughs> um, I, I've been a, I was a cop for thirty years. Um, the research says that testosterone levels in males that are first responders are extremely low. So I right. finally got my testosterone checked. I was in the lowest 3% of the population. Yeah. I now take weekly injections of uh, testosterone and my life, it's, it's life altering. Um, so, and, and the doctor is telling me that, uh, that my risk for stroke, heart attack, uh, diabetes, is in addition to me feeling way better is significantly reduced. So um, I, I'm a big advocate of uh, go get checked. <laughs> uh, do get ask your doctor for blood work uh, if you're a woman or if you're a, a man, and 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 definitely keep this on your radar. This hormone replacement therapy. Absolutely. Yeah, we don't talk about testosterone in women enough as well. Certainly we, you know, we're using it in men quite obviously. And I think more men are seeking out support there, even if they're in the sort of low levels of normal, they are finding that they're feeling much more energized. Mood is better. Um, again, their muscle mass is a little better. All of these things are improved. Um, when they're taking testosterone. And for women too, it's kind of an off label at this point. I do not believe the FDA, FDA has approved testosterone hormone therapy for women um, to mitigate some of the symptoms, but it is being used. It's being used more and more. More doctors are educating themselves on the use of testosterone in women. For libido specifically, it can make a massive difference. And low libido is a, is a really big issue for women in both perimenopause and menopause. So yeah, I think in the coming years, we're going to hear a lot more about testosterone, um, certainly for men, but also for women as a, as a form of hormone therapy as well. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, I'm glad we got that little piece in and we're going to go over to Deborah just before we get into our next question for Deborah. Deborah, I want to congratulate you. I'm going to get the sleep study and using a CPAP because I also use one of those and my, my stop breathing uh, rates are off the charts and that is also a significant improvement to my life is being able to sleep with that thing. And, and uh, it's definitely an improvement for not only yourself, but your partner, because you're not snoring all night. So it's a, it's a, it's a great thing. So kudos to you, Deborah. And uh, you also mentioned in our pre-chats, Deborah, that blood, urine and saliva tests can be expensive and not accurate. Um, what, uh, what do you have to say about that? Well, as I said, um, I was sent for lots of tests, and, and a lot of times I had to pay for the tests, uh, blood tests, urine, saliva. Um, as Jody indicated, like your your hormones are fluctuating all month long, and the day of the test is what it's going to show. But my hormones can fluctuate again differently the next day, the next week, or whatever. So it's not always uh, a perfect. Um, test that can give a result, although it can help. It certainly did help my natural path. Um, it helped my, I also go to a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. It helped her understand a bit more of me. So that's where I didn't mind paying for them because it did help, but it didn't give a perfect answer. Now, Jody, before we stray away from HRT, I'm just going to circle back. I have a couple more questions. I'm, I'm just wondering when a woman would consider HRT and, you know, is it when the symptoms arise prior to and, and how long can you be on it? Um, we probably don't want to start HRT before we're symptomatic because we would assume before we're symptomatic that our hormones are maintaining things just fine on their own, right? Um, and too much of a good thing is not a good thing always. So, um, but once we are symptomatic, 
And depending on how intense those symptoms are, we can start HRT. Um, and in terms of how long we want to be on it, actually, I'm going to go back for a minute there. Um, what we have learned about hormone therapy, and that study I um, mentioned earlier was a big part of this, we've learned that we don't want to be starting HRT if we're more than 10 years or so um, postmenopausal. So if we haven't had a period for 10 years, 12 years, and then we're thinking about starting HRT, that's when a bit more risk comes in. So although we can start it really at any time we're experiencing symptoms, we don't want to wait too long if that's our intention either. If we're really struggling, we wouldn't, we shouldn't wait too long. That can be when there's a few more side effects associated with them and a few more health risks associated with it. So we don't want to, we don't want to go 10, 12 years postmenopausal and then start on our hormone therapy. In terms of how long we can be on it though, there's really no clear answer, meaning we really could be on it for the rest of our lives. We're not looking to bring our hormone levels back to what they were. We're just looking to get just enough that our quality of life is maintained and that we're not as symptomatic. So that's actually why I don't really love the word replacement. And we're starting just to call it hormone therapy now because we're not replacing what's been lost. That's a natural process. Our hormones are going to decline. We're just trying to get, again, just enough to base it on or to, to mitigate the symptoms. And yes, we really can do that. If we're feeling good on hormone therapy and that estrogen is protective and it's helping our bones and it help, it's helping our cardiovascular system and we're feeling good, we could be on that for a very long time. We could be on that until, until the day we die. Um, so I'll kick it over to Deborah. You know, we're discussing all the different avenues for using HRT. So Deborah, I'm curious how you discovered what is best for you. Um, I went to a naturopath, uh, and she was great. She um, started me off with progesterone, first of all, and then we added in the estradiol. Uh, both are a cream that I was using, um, and we kept tweaking it. Um, and this has been over a year and a half, and now I'm to the point where I'm on a good dose of the estradiol on a cream. But the progesterone, I had to go to a pill, Um the, too much of the progesterone cream made me nauseous and I was to the level of the estradiol that I needed to have the pill. So we went back to my doctor and with the help of her, we, we uh, spoke to my doctor and he was awesome. He, rec he gave me a prescription right away and I've been on the cream <clears throat> and the pill. So it has been absolutely life changing for me. I am to the point where I can work out again. I am not doing something and then sitting down for an hour because I'm exhausted. Um, the pain in my body is honestly starting to go away. I still have a bit. Don't get me wrong. I still have arthritis from 30 years of pushing a cruiser, but, um, you know, I'm working out, but I can do things. I'm back working out. I'm back lifting weights. I am on a really good diet right now. Um, that I'm, I've lost 15 pounds out of the 30 that I've gained in the last few years. That's, that's uh, awesome uh, to hear, Deborah. Um, I got another question for you. Um, so some people might be saying, is, is, are these drugs, are they covered by benefits? Um, can you get hormone replacement therapy through your doctor? Can your naturopath uh, prescribe it? How does that work? So my naturopath just prescribed it to begin with, um, but when I had to go on to the oral um, progesterone, it had to go through the doctor because she just doesn't have that ability. Um, yes, it is covered by our benefits, thank goodness. Um, and it does, I mean, that certainly does help. We pay the little bit of the money that we have to pay, but it's covered by our benefits. So a very common term, probably the most common term that we hear women even joke about, but it's really not that funny, is, is hot flashes. And uh, I'll just leave this question open if you can explain what is happening when a woman experiences this and why, and, and how can a woman sort of equip herself to feel a little bit more comfortable on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, with the hot flushes that I have, it came from the core and it comes right from the core and it just goes out and it just suddenly shows up. And it could be a little bit, it could be a lot, but there was times where it just go, Phew, 
and like the whole body would turn hot. And I remember seeing a woman I knew years ago and she'd be dripping with sweat. I didn't get that point, but you know, my undergarments would be soaking wet by the time it was finished, but then you freeze right after you are frozen. Um, at night, I was having several of them and I've gotten to the point where I can, most of them are pretty good. I don't have them as much, but if I do, I just sort of stick out that uh, thermometer leg as we call it or pull the back the covers or lift my shirt up a little bit and expose my tummy and until I cool down and then I throw my shirt back down and back on the covers so that I warm up again. Um, for clothing, it was, it's difficult because it really isn't a lot. Uh, moisture wicking clothing under your, your uniform helps, but uh, I always kept an extra head to toe clothing in my, my locker just in case I needed to change halfway through the day. All good things to know. Uh, Deborah, I know you, you and I joked about it. You put it, you put this into your key messages about libido. Can, can you explain that for uh, all, all of us out here? Well, I know there's some women that uh, their libido goes super high and others, they drop down very low. And one woman once said to me, she goes, yeah, it's closed for the season. As she said to me, and I just, I had a laugh with her on that's, that's closed for the season. I don't know when the season's going to open up again. So, um, yeah, it, I mean, I think it has a lot to do with, with the estrogen and the progesterone, but it also has a lot to do with your body image. I know for me, um, I do have a problem with body image. Uh, I am not one to walk around. At least I don't think I am to show off or anything like that, but um, I've gained this 30 pounds. I don't want my husband even looking at me, let alone anything else fun. And I feel bad for him. Uh, so like for me, it, it became a, a confidence thing and uh, don't look at me and all the lights have to be off. And that's where I was at. But with some friends of mine, they're like, Yahoo. And they are at the top of their game. Deborah, we did talk about this in the past, and I just wanted to touch on diet and exercise one more time in our conversation. And if you could just touch on why it really matters so much that women pay attention to this aspect uh, when they're in peri or, or in menopause, and, and why it is so important for women uh, to pay attention to diet and exercise. Because there's so many changes in your in your body, um, the diet, you get visceral fat, which is, is not good. It's that horrible fat that sits around our the middle of our belly. And, um, well, you have to go buy new clothes really quickly, it seems. And you can't lose it very easily. So if you can try and get on top of it. Now, I thought I was. I was trying to work it. I was working out lots. Um, I was trying to watch my diet. Uh, my job title changed. So I was working um, with a different police service. And I was working... 24 seven almost because we had a lack of staff and my stress level was high. And because my stress level is high, I tend to stress eat without realizing it, or I tend to not eat at all because I'm so busy. I forget to eat and that creates havoc with your metabolism. And when that happens and you have stress and cortisol levels, you tend to hold on to the fat and then you don't work out as much and then you're sore to work out. So it becomes a really vicious cycle of, I'm too sore to work out, but I need to work out in order to lose the weight, in order to feel better. But I can't lose the weight because I'm too sore to work out. Same as the diet. So um, this past summer, I got lucky. I, I won a contest. I am working with an amazing trainer, and she's a nutritionist. Um, and because of my HRT is working so well, I feel I can do this now. I am. I mean, things are still sore a bit, but I'm working out every day again. I am walking and walking is probably the number one thing a woman during menopause, menopausal and premenopausal can do because it's not so hard on your body as maybe running. I miss running, but I'm, I find my knees, I can't handle it with my knees anymore. So I'm walking and I'm getting on the treadmill and walking the dogs. And that's really good because I'm outside as well. Um, lifting the weights. I've done some Olympic weight lifting uh, with another trainer and she's amazing and she really supports me. I've gone to yoga. I've started with a yoga studio and even that's awesome. Um, yesterday I did a workout and then I went to yoga and did restorative and that was to help calm my mind. So there's different ways of working out and different ways of bringing that stress level down so that you don't hold on to that fat and 
I mean, we're going to all change our bodies anyways, because we're going through another chapter of our life. But if you can sort of help it along by not overeating, by trying to cut down some of the stuff that we know we shouldn't have. Uh, I know a lot of girls like to have wine at the night to, to relax themselves. I don't usually drink, but if I do have a glass of wine, I feel I'm up all night long because it's doing the absolute opposite. It's not relaxing me. I am spun and I'm awake. I'm awake all night long from it. But, uh, interesting points, uh, Jody. I, I just feel this need to congratulate you on figuring this out for yourself, the losing the 15 pounds and, in your active lifestyle I, and for sharing all of this uh, publicly on a podcast. I, 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 congratulations. You, you're doing uh, amazing stuff. And, um, Thank you. I, I'd want to switch over to Jody. Um, we've kind of been talking about the overall picture here and I've got this burning question about does, does menopause increase our risk of disease? Uh, yes, it does. To put it bluntly, it does. And it, it increases it significantly. Um, so estrogen is just so protective of so many different disease processes in our body. Uh, estrogen is very anti-inflammatory. It's neuroprotective. It's cardioprotective. So cardiovascular disease is a big one. It is the leading cause of death in women in the postmenopausal years. Our risk just skyrockets as soon as we hit menopause to the point that I think the stat is one in three women will die of cardiovascular disease. So that's huge. That's huge. So estrogen is very cardioprotective. It helps to prevent plaque formation within our blood vessels. Um, Estrogen also supports our bones. So it supports a healthy balance of bone building and bone loss. Um, therefore protects us against osteoporosis, osteopenia, which again, also skyrockets when we, uh, when we hit menopause, I think again, the stat is one in three women will have an osteoporotic fracture in their lifetime compared to one in five men. So women are at a higher risk of that. And that is, I believe, due to the estrogen loss in uh, our postmenopausal years. We see a significant rise in menopause in what Deborah was saying, visceral fat. So that's actually not the fat that we can grab. It's the fat around our organs. So we see a lot of like um, fatty liver, that type of thing in, in menopause. And that is a very unhealthy fat to accumulate. Again, it really increases our cardiovascular risk. So yes, disease disease risk is a is a big one. It's a big one. And it's something, again, that I think women really need to understand um, because it's not just about the symptoms in perimenopause. It's about what we can do to support our body, whether it's hormone therapy, whether it's the exercise, the diet, the all of this going forward to minimize some of that risk as it really skyrockets when we hit menopause. So, I mean, we've covered a lot of information in this short amount of time. Is there anything else beyond maybe what we've discussed already that that might be helpful for women? That's a great question. I think just educating yourself, um, again, talking to family members, to friends about what they're going through, really just trying to... Um, focus on a healthy diet, you know, again, just make that vessel as healthy as possible, having open conversations with your doctor or your naturopath about what your options are. If you don't want to go to hormone therapy for whatever reason, what your, what other natural options you have, how to best support your body. If hormone therapy is an option, then just opening that door and having an informed conversation about what that would look like or where you would start or when you would start. Just, just really the education piece and the talking piece. We just need to be talking about it. We need to be talking about it with our spouses, with our coworkers, uh, with our friends, and just educating ourselves in, in any way, in every way we can. Now, you mentioned, edu- I don't want to put you on the spot here, but mm-hmm. educating yourself. Do you have any resources off the top of your head that, that you could direct women towards to, to learn more? Um, as Deborah said, there is a ton of podcasts out there, but yeah, the quality, some are going to be better than others. Yeah. Um, Menoverse is a website uh, that has some really great information on menopause education. Um, the Menopause uh, Society also really great information on their website. So both Menopause Society or Menoverse would be a great place to start just to kind of get some 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 basic information and kind of go from there. 
Thanks, uh, Jody. Um, very enlightening. Um, I, I'm really curious to know about how many women out there that listen to this podcast actually get the men in their lives to listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> so feel free to drop us a line at communications at oppa.ca, especially, especially on that. I'd love to know. And uh, if... Um, also, uh, if you have any ideas for future podcasts, that's that's uh, and, and if you wanted to get in touch with Deborah, or you wanted to get in touch with uh, Doctor Jody Snyder, uh, that's the email to to send to, and we'll we'll hook you up. So uh, we're we're coming to the end of our podcast, but we often like to ask our guests uh, their three wishes for change, and that can be anything. It can be dealing with the topic that we're talking about. It could be anything in the world. So Jody. Over to you. What are your three wishes? Um, I'm going to keep it in relation to the conversation we've been having. So number one, I just feel like there needs to be more research on women in general, on anything, not just to do with menopause, on every disease process, on uh, women's bodies and how they're different to men's, how women metabolize different drugs differently, how women metabolize food differently, about just all of the different needs that women have versus men historically. Um, our research is all done by men on men. And I do think that's changing um, and it, it needs to continue to change. We need more research on women, um, ideally done by women as well, but uh, um, more research on the female body in general. And that probably leads to my next wish, which is that there's just more medical education on perimenopause and menopause in particular. You know, if women make up half of our population and every woman is going to go through perimenopause and menopause at some point in their life, then we need to go back to even like the medical school curriculum and make sure we're covering this, I think, to a bigger extent um, so that our medical doctors are more versed on what's happening and how to support uh, the female population through this change. And then I'm just going to repeat myself and say more conversation. I wish for more conversation in general, more conversations like this. Um, I will really want to thank Deborah for, for coming up with the idea and reaching out. This is such a great conversation to be having with this population of people as well. Um, so more conversations, more conversations with our, our friends, our colleagues, our coworkers, our spouses, all of it. Just keep talking about it and supporting the women in our lives. Great wishes for sure. Deborah, over to you. What are your three wishes? Well, my first wish would be that I hope, I wish women would know that, yes, this is natural. And as my one son said, suck it up, mom. It's only a couple of years. But you don't have to suffer through it. There is lots of ways to deal with it. And I wish that they would seek out those. And if no one is helping them, keep advocating for yourself. Uh, my second wish is... I wish that the men in our lives, work or at home, would listen to podcasts like this or get to know the information. I was very fortunate. I made my husband listen to a podcast and he was enlightened beyond. And he actually shared this podcast with some of his friends who he thought needed to understand their wives a bit better. And my third wish is I wish that all of our listeners who are going to be going through this or are going through this have very few symptoms and I wish them well in their endeavors in this. And as I said, there is help, whether you just talk to someone and know that you're not crazy, know that these are real things and just work on the confidence level, work on the fitness work on the food and don't be too hard on yourself because this is a new chapter in our lives and things are changing. But uh, as much as you want to accept it, fight it a little bit. Nothing wrong with that. Well, Deborah, Deborah, I want to congratulate you on the persistence of making this podcast recording happen because this would not have happened uh, without you and uh and you're you're being so brave to to share and your willingness to to pull this together go find dr uh, jody snyder um, we've been talking for quite a while so um, i'm really happy with how this uh how this turned out do you, do you have any last words uh, departing words deborah well i thought this was a great thing because as i said there's a hundred percent of our women who are going to go through this and 
we're celebrating 50 years of women in policing. And I wanted to be a police officer when I was four years old. And there was no such thing as women police officers then. So I'm glad I was able to fulfill my dream, even though I'm really short and I didn't hit the height back then. And I'm glad I can bring this to the women who know that they're not alone. And Jody, over to you. Do you have any final thoughts for us? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just echo what Scott said in terms of thanking Deborah for for being really persistent and making this conversation happen. I think especially in the policing community, it, it's a really important conversation. Um, and I just want women to know that they're not alone, that we're all going through it. And there are so many resources out there and there are so many solutions and they really shouldn't have to suffer through it. Um, the hormone changes obviously that happen in perimenopause and menopause are normal and natural, but it shouldn't be something that we just grin and bear and suffer through. So get help, seek help and, uh, and get support. And yeah, thank you, Deborah, so much for, for forcing this conversation. Such an important topic. You have been listening to retired OPP provincial constable, Deborah Brown and naturopathic doctor, Jody Snyder. If you like what you hear, please hit the subscribe button on the podcasting platform of your choice. We release a new episode every other Friday. And as Scott mentioned, if you have any ideas for future episodes, please do reach out to us by email at communications at oppa.ca. For Scott Mills and myself, thanks for listening. And until next time, stay safe.